what book do you know best? Now, I'm not asking you what, what's your favorite book or, you know, what's your most memorable experience with a book. I want to know what book you know best. So if I were to invite you to my classroom to lecture, right, you're the guest lecturer for the day, what book would you talk about? That means that you know the characters, you know the themes, you know the setting, you're an expert. What book do you know best? And what if you're sitting there and you're saying, Mr. Escobar, I don't think I know any book that well. Well, it doesn't matter. That's why you're here today. And we're going to prepare for the literary argument question. I'm Mr. Carlos Escobar coming to you from Miami, Florida, enjoying every second that I'm with you because the exam is only a week away for some of you and a few weeks away for some of you who will be taking the digital exam. But before we get into the literary argument question, I want to address what some of the students have said in the uh, comment sheet that's right underneath the, the, the YouTube uh, video. And students have been asking questions, and I want to address them, particularly because one student asked, are you really reading all these questions? And the answer is, of course, we're reading all these questions. But we may not be able to answer all of them all at once, but we promise that we're going to try to get through as many, if not all, of the questions that you have asked. So let me, let me address some of them now. Someone asked, do I need to place an arrow telling the reader where my thesis statement is? And the answer is no, absolutely not. You do not have to place arrows. We I've never seen arrows being placed by anyone. And, 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 and there's, there's two ways of thinking about this. First of all, some students are going to take this exam in a digital format. So you can't really draw in an arrow because that functionality is just not there. But even if you're taking the paper exam, there's no need for you to tell us exactly where the thesis statement is because we're going to read every single word. You know, just like some of you asked, are you going to read all of our comments here? We will. Well, we're also going to read every word of your essay. And regardless of where you put your thesis statement, we're going to get to it and we're going to recognize it as a thesis. So there's no need. Thank you. And, you know, I, I, I know you're trying to help us out, but there's no need to label anything in your essay. Someone else asked, when we're providing context for, and I assume they mean the broader context, for, for whatever we're reading, whatever we're writing about, is it okay if we use first person pronouns? And the answer is yes. Now, I know the purists out there and I know what, what you're thinking. You know, in a formal essay, we should avoid first person pronouns. We should not have any first person pronouns. We should stick to third person. And look, that, that's, that's a perfectly legitimate and solid piece of advice. And, and if you were to ever write a, a polished final draft of a paper, and I'm still going to call it a draft, right, because you can always revise, then, then maybe that's right. Now, remember two things. Number one, this is a draft. This is a first draft. This is a 40-minute draft. We're not expecting perfection. Now, if we want to extend this argument further, you know, sometimes first person is okay, depending on the the writing context, but I understand we're writing a formal essay. We want to avoid first person, and that's good advice. I'm not contradicting what your teachers are saying, but what I'm trying to tell you is write the best essay you can. And if when you're trying to situate the text within a broader context, you want to discuss we or us and how we fit in this poem or this passage or this novel, then go ahead and do that. If that's going to help you write the better essay, if you're going to communicate your ideas in that manner more effectively, then go ahead and do it. It's a draft. It's okay. We, we're not penalizing you for doing bad things or breaking rules. That's not how this functions. Someone asked me, where, what book should I buy to review vocabulary terms or grammar for this AP exam? And here's the beauty of this AP exam. You don't have to memorize vocabulary words. You don't have to go right now a week before your exam and learn some grammar rules. At this stage, you're better off focusing on what we're going to talk about today, as a matter of fact, reviewing the novels and plays that you've read with your teacher instead of 
you know, learning new words that somehow are going to impress the reader. I, I want you to remember this. We are not impressed by fancy words. We're not. If you know fancy words and you use them and you use them correctly, well, good for you. But we're impressed by fancy ideas. We're impressed by sophisticated ideas. We're impressed by nuanced ideas. We're impressed by students who know what the prompt is and they answer the prompt and they provide evidence and they provide commentary. So this isn't an exercise in trying to use the, the biggest words. Let's not focus on that. Let's try to focus on the right word as opposed to the most sophisticated word, right? So don't worry right now about memorizing any sort of terminology. Even as someone had asked me about the multiple choice section, you're never going to be asked to define a term. As a matter of fact, a lot of the terms that, that sometimes you know teachers tell you to memorize may not even be part of the exam and, and won't be part of the exam, right? So focus on what we're talking about today if you want to review, if you want to prepare, but don't go out and memorize words. That's just not, not a, that's not a good use of your time. And then the last question I'm going to address today is someone asked me, how many paragraphs should the essay be? And I don't want to contradict anything your teachers may have told you, right? So if you've been practicing a certain format for an essay the whole year and you're comfortable with that format, then stick to that format. I am never going to tell you how many paragraphs. What I will say is this. You should have a beginning. And, and ideally, in that beginning, there's going to be a thesis statement, although some students place their thesis statements anywhere else, right? But there should be a beginning. And in that beginning, you should sort of take a stance. Tell me what the paper is going to be about, what your essay is going to be about. Then there should be a middle. And in that middle, you're providing evidence and you're providing commentary. And it's good to wrap things up, right? So an essay should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. How many paragraphs should an essay be? Well, three, four, five, six, ten. It depends on so many things, right? It depends on how quickly you write, how many ideas you can come up with. It depends on how much time you have. So in these 40 minutes, I recommend you have a solid beginning that creates a blueprint for the rest of the essay. And you develop a couple body paragraphs, a few body paragraphs, and don't read into that. I'm not saying two or three, right? Just organize your ideas into paragraphs and then wrap it up. So don't focus on achieving a certain number. Focus on having a beginning where you preferably give your answer, a middle and an end. And this is a good segue into what we're talking about today because today we're talking about the literary argument question. So what exactly are we gonna learn about this literary argument question? And, and I, I want us to use vocabulary that we're all comfortable with, right? You might call this, or your teachers may call this question three or the open-ended question. But regardless of what word or what phrase you use for this, today, common language between you and me, we're gonna talk about the literary argument question. And we're gonna talk about the stable prompt for this question. What does it look like? And why does it look so different from the others? So how do we approach this FRQ? I feel pretty confident approaching poetry. I feel pretty confident approach, approaching the prose question, but this one seems so different. Have I prepared for this one? How do I write this essay? We're gonna tackle all those questions today. What about that list of titles that is provided? Now you might be sitting there and, and maybe you've never seen one of these and you will today, right? Or maybe you have seen this title, this, this list and you're still wondering, is that, do I choose from that list? Are these the best titles to choose from? We're gonna talk about that as we proceed today. But I also wanna give you some tips for this literary argument question. And I wanna talk about this, this notion 
that you should provide plot for this one? Well, no, that's never the case. We're not looking for a summary. We're not looking for you to tell us a story. We're looking for your interpretation of this work of literature. So we're going to talk about how we distinguish between plot and analysis as we move along. So ultimately, you know, we take all of these things together. And what we're really talking about today is how do we prepare for the literary argument FRQ or free response question? And I have all of you in mind, whether you're testing in, in a week or two or three or four, whether you're testing on paper or digitally, there's still time for you to prepare and be effective and successful in this question. But we have to start working today. We have to start working tonight. So let's see at what we're going to do. Let's start with reviewing the stable prompt. Okay, we, we've talked about stable prompts before. We know that there's a, a, a certain wording. We know that there are certain features that each of these three prompts in the FRQ section will, will have. But what does the literary argument stable prompt look like? I want us to think of it in terms of three different components. Parts one, two, and three. Part one is where your task will be given to you. As it states here, a literary concept or, or idea will be presented. And then you must analyze how that concept, concept or idea contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. Let's take a moment, let's breathe. Let's figure this out. So a concept or idea is going to be given to me, okay? But then there's this other bit about the interpretation of the work as a whole. So I, I want us to think of this concept or idea that is presented to us in this first part of the, the prompt as a launching pad, okay? It's, it, it, it's a door, it's a vehicle, it's a conduit to the meaning of the work as a whole. And what I mean by that is, let's take the topic that we are given, whether the topic is sibling relationships, or the importance of nature, or the importance of technology, or a symbol, or home, right? Any notion that is presented in this first part of the prompt is what we have to think about deeply and understand that this topic is now what we're going to use to really open up the meaning, the purpose, the, the rationale, the thematic force of this book. So that's given to you in part one. Part two, we're more comfortable with because it looks like the stable prompt wording for the first two questions, or sorry, the, the poetry and the prose questions. Here's where you're going to be giving a bulleted list of expectations for the essay. Now, the great thing about these three essays in the FRQ se section is that the expectations are all the same. You need to have a thesis. You need to have evidence. You need to have a line of reasoning. You need to have commentary that, that, that guides the reader through your interpretation and the, all the connections that you're making. Oh, yeah, and we got to use proper grammar as well, right? So there's nothing new here. And, and, and I want us to relax. I don't want us to think of these three essays in the FRQ section as three different sets of rules or three different obstacles. No, the, the rules are the same. Read, think, interpret, and now share this with the world. Then the third part, this is the part that's different very different for this question. This is where we're provided with a list of texts. It's gonna be approximately 40 titles, but you can select your own text as well. And, and this is the part that's confusing and, and I want you to focus on what I'm saying, all right? Do you remember how, how I opened today? I said, what book do you know best? What book do you know best? And I didn't ask you from the following list which book do you know best? I didn't ask you, select one of these books. No, I said, what, which book do you know best? Preferably, hopefully, 
a book you studied this year with your teacher, a book that you discussed with your classmates and that you 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 really wrestled with and, and, and thought about deeply as you sat in this AP English literature course. So these are the three parts of the stable prompt wording. So let's look at an example. Here's part one. Now remember, I said part one will always give you the task and it's going to ask you to think about the interpretation of the work as a whole. So let's see if we find it here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read it quickly because we are going to come back to this prompt. In many works of literature, characters who have been away from home return and find that they no longer have the same feelings about home as they once did. As novelist James Agee writes in A Death in the Family, you can go home, it's good to go home, but you never really get all the way home again in your life. Either from your own reading or from the list below, choose a work of fiction in which a character's return home is problematic. Home is not what it once was perceived to be. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how that character's response to his or her home contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole, to not merely summarize the plot. Like I said, we're going to delve into this and we're gonna, we're gonna look at the different components, but I want you to hear that this is where your task is. There's something about home and, and, and there's, there's certainly a, a, a job, a question that now we have to come in and answer, but stay tuned. Let's look at part two. In your response, you should do the following. Respond to the prompt with a thesis that presents a defensible interpretation. This isn't new. We've se seen this with poetry. We've seen this with prose. Provide evidence to support your line of reasoning. Now this, perhaps we should talk about a little bit because for the poetry question and for the prose question, we have the text in front of us. But for this literary argument question, we don't have the text in front of us. So what are the expectations in terms of evidence? Do you have to memorize a bunch of quotations before the exam? Absolutely not. Can you have the book with you? Absolutely not, right? So what do we mean by evidence? Well, what, what we mean is, can you pinpoint to specific moments in the novel or play that are significant, and then you give us the interpretation or the analysis of those moments and how they tie in to the topic and to the meaning of the work as a whole. And, and like I said earlier, we are gonna talk about how we provide reference points, which will be your evidence, as opposed to providing summary, which is not what we are after here. Then the third bullet says, explain how the evidence supports your line of reasoning. Again, this is your commentary. This is your interpretation. This is where you hold the reader's hand and guide them through your thinking. And as always, we are asking you to use appropriate grammar and punctuation in communicating your argument. I, I, I want to remind you, though, this is a draft. And I'm always going to go back to that statement because it's okay to misspell something. It's okay to have maybe a run-on sentence here, right? It, it, it's okay to make mistakes. Now, what you don't wanna do is repeat the same mistake because then at that point, you might be communicating that there is a skill that you haven't learned, right? There, there, there is, there, there's something you haven't quite mastered at that moment, but I don't want you to be nervous about the comma. Do I put a comma or not? Do I just try your best and move on? We are really reading in search of your interpretation and your ideas and what you have to offer. Okay, so try your best in terms of grammar and punctuation, always, but that's not really what we are testing you on, if you will. And then this is the, the last part. And it's usually, it's always going to be two columns, but here, just so that we could read it, I placed it in three columns. But here's a list of titles, and we're going to talk about this because when you look at this list, it it might be terrifying, it might be humbling, it might be exciting. You know, you're going to have different reactions to this list depending on whether you have read the, the the works listed. But stay tuned. I don't want you to get nervous yet because, like I said, 
you don't have to select one of these works. So let's practice. And there's the prompt. And you might be thinking, wait, Mr. Escobar, I can't read that, right? Like PowerPoint rule number one, everything should be legible. Well, I don't want you to read this, okay? When you get to, look, look at the title here. It says, how do we approach this FRQ? Well, we don't read it. That's not where we begin, okay? What I want you to do actually is I want you to think about what text you've read this year. That's what I want you to do. As soon as you get to this FRQ, if you're doing it on paper, jot them down. If you're doing it digitally, maybe type them up very quickly, right? And then you could delete it afterwards. But I want you to write down the text that you have read this year. Now, you might be thinking, Mr. Escobar, that's, that's not necessary. But that's a waste of my time. And it's not. Remember, you've already sat through a multiple choice for one hour, 55 questions you have already written a couple of essays by the time that you get to this one you're going to be tired you're going to forget things and sometimes it helps to just have that visual there so i want you to write down the text that you have read this year before you even read the prompt and then we look at the prompt and remember this is part one and we already read it, but, but let's read it again. And I'm going to read it quickly. In many works of literature, characters who have been away from home return and find that they no longer have the same feelings about home as they once did. As novelist James Agee writes in The Death of the Family, you can go home, it's good to go home, but you never really get all the way home again in your life. Either from your own reading or from the list below, choose a work of fiction in which a character's return home is problematic. Home is not what it once was perceived to be. Then, in a well-written essay, analyze how the character's response to his or her home contrib contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize the plot. Remember, I said part one gives us the topic or the idea. And here, I think home is the idea that the question is trying to convey. Look at how many times. Maybe I <clears throat> skipped one or two, but, 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 but this is a lot of uh, repetition of the word home. So I'm grounding myself. This is going to be an essay that uses the idea of home as the launching pad to discuss the meaning of the work as a whole. But there's always a nuance. What about home? Right? Am I talking about <clears throat> how do I feel about my home? Am I talking about the importance of home? Am I talking about uh, whether I've ever felt like I'm at home anywhere, right? It's not that open of a question. They're going to give you a lens through which to think about this topic. And here, I think the lens is this part right here. A character's re return home is problematic, and home is not what it once was. That's what I want to focus on. So I'm not just talking about home. I need to think of a character who leaves home or something happens to their home, but then that forces them to recognize that <clears throat> the whole concept of home has changed or perhaps the physical location somehow doesn't feel the same. And I always have to make this connection. I'm gonna use that concept of home and how home changes or the character changes and the perception of home is altered. I wanna make a connection between those concepts and the interpretation of the work as a whole. This is part one of the, the question. Part two, like we already saw, <clears throat> Well, actually, to address this part one, let, let, let's, let's go here. Remember how you wrote a list of the books that you have read? Now's when you return to that list and you read. You know, I don't care what books or how many books you've listed here, but I want you to go through each one. And you're not selecting your favorite book. You're not selecting the book that, you know, you want your best friend to read. The question now becomes, if I have to select a book from this list that discusses the concept of home or in which the concept of home is important, particularly how home can be problematic once you return to it, 
which of these books should I select? And I want you to go ahead <clears throat> and choose one. All right, make a determination. Remember, we haven't looked at the 40 titles that the College Board is providing. You've already selected your book. Now you look at the list and you're gonna examine this list. You're not gonna skim this list. You're going to examine this list and you're gonna think about this list very, very carefully. Now is when you're being judicious, you're weighing. I already circled a title. I know what book I want to use, but let me look through this list. Is there a book that I have forgotten? Now, whenever I meet students or whenever I meet teachers, this is one of the questions I always get. If I selected, let's say, the Scarlet Letter, and I circled the Scarlet Letter, that's the book I want to use. But then I come here, and I don't see the Scarlet Letter. Oh, but I see Death of a Salesman. Ah, oh, man, Death of a Salesman works, doesn't it? Biff goes, and then he comes back, but home isn't the same. Uh, well, the college boy listed Death of a Salesman, so clearly they're communicating to me that Death of a Salesman is a better work for this question than the Scarlet Letter, right? Wrong. That's not how this list works. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe me. These are not the best books to use. These are not the books that will earn you extra points or brownie points or extra credit. That is not the purpose of this list. You know what the purpose of this list is? You're tired, you're nervous, you're taking an exam and you're asked, well, what book have you read where home is important and you freeze? Jesus, I've never read anything. Wow, I've never read anything. I don't have any books. I don't have any books in my brain. I, I, I'm frozen. This is it. I'm, I, I can't write an essay. I'm, I'm letting myself down. I'm letting my parents down. I'm letting my teacher down. This is terrible, terrible news. That's why the list is there. We're trying to tell you, relax. It's okay if you're nervous. It's okay if you can't think of a book right now. Look through this list. Maybe there's something here that you've read. And if there is, go for it. But this list is not, I'm going to repeat it. I've said it maybe twice already. This is not a list of the best books to use for this prompt. I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. All of these books are good to use for this prompt. But no one is weighing what is the best book to use. That's up to you. It goes back to the first question I asked you today. Which book do you know best? If you know The Scarlet Letter better than you know Death of a Salesman, then write about The Scarlet Letter. You can earn maximum points writing about The Scarlet Letter if you know it, if you're going to provide analysis and interpretation rather than summary, if you're going to answer the question, you're going to talk about home, you're going to contextualize it, you're going to talk about the meaning of the work as a whole. So this list is a, a safety mechanism in case you get nervous and you can't think of a book. But you will select the book that you know best, whether or not it's on this list. So what should our takeaways be today? What, what should we be focusing on? I want us to focus on two major tips moving forward. And again, some of you are testing on paper very soon. Some of you will have a few extra weeks because you're testing digitally, but, but you have plenty of time, okay? No, no one has an advantage or a disadvantage here. It's just a matter of, you know, looking at a calendar and deciding when you're going to do what. So I want us to focus on two tips today. The first tip will deal with this whole notion of plot versus analysis. How should I think about this? How should I approach it? Mr. Escobar, you're telling me to focus on analysis instead of plot. How do I do that? And the second tip, it's a multi-layered tip, is going to focus on how should you prepare? 
what should you do tonight and for the next few nights in preparation for the literary argument question. So let's look at this. <clears throat> Again, number one, we'll focus on plot versus analysis. Don't provide a sequence of events. And, and I, feel, I feel terrible doing this because this may be a moment where I contradict maybe what some of your friends have told you or maybe even what, what, what some well-intentioned teachers have told you. So I, I apologize ahead of time, but you don't have to provide us with a summary of the book. And I've had a lot of students tell me, Mr. Escobar, but I've been told that out of consideration to the reader, I should give them plot summary. I should remind them what the book is about. Ladies and gentlemen, you do not have to have consideration for the reader in that way. You want to have consideration for the reader? Give us your intellect. That, that's when you're doing us a favor. That's when you're getting us excited about scoring your paper. You should not worry about, does the reader know this book? That's for us to handle. Okay, you, you got to imagine, as a matter of fact, maybe it'll even come across as a little condescending, right? If you're saying, well, let me tell you what the Scarlet Letter is about. Some of these readers, not only have they lectured on the Scarlet Letter, maybe they've written books on the Scarlet Letter, right? So you're in no position to, to, to help us by reminding us of the summary. Thank you. But that's just not the point of this essay. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the prompt, it said, do not merely summarize the, the plot. There's no need. If I receive an essay on a book that I've never read, on a book that I'm not comfortable you know, reading an essay on because I, I, can't, I can't follow anything, well, then I'll give it to one of my colleagues and they'll read your paper. So do not feel the need to give us the story. What you should do is give us your interpretation of the major events in the story, right? You're supposed to give us the analysis and not the storyline. But how do you do that? How do you, and I understand it, it's difficult when you're writing an essay because you want to pinpoint a certain section. Well, how do you do that without plot? I'm going to give you one idea, right? So how do we avoid plot? Well, we could provide the reference in a dependent clause, right? So a dependent clause is technically a fragment because something else should follow, right? The independent part of this. So provide the reference point in a dependent clause. For example, when Hamlet sees the ghost, and now you provide analysis about the importance of that section. Right, so notice you are situating me somewhere within that play. You're placing me somewhere. I know exactly what the events are in that scene. <clears throat> but now you're going to give me your, your analysis of why it's significant. The second example says, once Edna returns to Grand Isle, now you're going to provide analysis. Right, you don't have to tell me that Robert was with Edna, and then the you know the, the maid came in and told Edna about Madame Ratignol, and then she left, and then when she came back, Robert was gone, and then she. There's no need. There, there's no need for that. All you have to tell us is once Edna returns to Grand Isle, and we know exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about the final chapter of the Awakening. The the, the main event is about to happen, and you're going to give us your interpretation of the significance of that final act that Edna takes. After Walter loses mama's money. Now we're in a raisin in the sun. You don't have to tell me how he lost the money, how they got the money, why Walter <clears throat> did this or did that. None of that is significant. You don't have to tell me the story. You have to provide the analysis. So one quick way of doing it is if you want to situate me somewhere, you want to pinpoint you know, what part of the landscape of this book you're, you're, you're going to be talking about, provide that reference in a dependent clause and then give me the analysis. Another way of doing it is refer to an act, scene, or chapter. 
if you remember that there's something major going on in Act 3, and, 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 and some people do know the books that well, you, you're able to say something along the lines of, you know, in, in the climatic moment in Chapter 27, and then you provide analysis of why it was climatic, why it was so important to the novel as a whole, you're giving me these reference points to then provide your commentary, your stance on the significance of those moments. I think the dependent clause tip is a really good tip at avoiding plot summary. The second tip, like I said, we're gonna deal with where do we go from here, right? How do we prepare for the literary argument FRQ today, tonight, when we only have a few nights or a few weeks left. <laughs> you might laugh, <laughs> but you know what I mean by this. Be honest about what you've actually read. Look, this is just you and me. Your teachers are not in the room. I'm not telling anyone. There is a chance that you haven't read every word of every book your teacher assigned to you. Now, if you were able to get away with that, in your class, well, you got lucky, right? You wouldn't be able to get away with that in my class. But when we're talking about the AP exam, let's be honest about what we know. And, and I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking, well, I watched the movie. I read the notes. I can, I can find my way through the essay. That's not how you should approach this. Again, let's go back to my first question. Which book do you know best? Which book do you know best? Not which summary do you know best? Not which movie did you watch? The readers can tell when you're writing about the movie. I'm gonna give you a good example. I read an essay once where someone was talking about that dramatic moment when Stanley Kowalski is ripping his shirt in the rain and calling for his wife. Well, yeah, I mean, technically that did occur in the play but not in the way that it appears in the movie. Um, and, and it was a dead giveaway that the student was talking about having watched the film as opposed to having read the play. So be honest about what you've actually read and prep those books for this essay question. For those texts that you have read, there's a bunch of things you can do. All right. Now, you don't have to do all of these, depending on how much time you have, how many AP classes you're preparing for. You can you can be selective here. You can create a character chart, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Perhaps you want to identify the three most important quotations and their significance. And I'm not telling you that this is what you should do to then memorize those quotations. But I think what's important right now is for us to go back to the text, for us to flip through that book or scroll through that book, right? If it's a digital version and, 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 and read through it and make decisions about what's important, what's less important, what's most significant. So randomly, you know, I'm, I'm giving you this assignment tonight. What are the three most important quotations in each of the books that you've read today? Uh, sorry, this year in AP English Literature, and explain the significance of those quotations. What about selecting the three most important plot points in a particular novel or play and explain their function, right? So a plot point could be when someone married someone else, when someone murdered someone else, when someone left home, right? when someone returned home. But don't give me the summary. Talk about the function of that event, the significance, the purpose of that event in the novel or play as a whole. Compile a list of subjects explored in the text. And I'm gonna delve into this just a little bit more in depth in one second, so, so bear with me. And then reread your annotations and class notes. You've sat through an entire semester, an entire year. I know there's different, combinations and permutations of how this class could look across the across the world. Oh, but you've taken notes, right? You, you've done projects, you've done homework assignments, you've done activities. Look through all those things because it's going to bring back the analysis and the discussions and the excitement that you shared with your classmates as you discuss these things with your teacher. Let me give you an example of a character chart. Let's take this for a doll's house, let's say. 
write down the, let's say the protagonist of the work. So here I'm writing Nora Helmer. And then I wanna write arrows all over the place of how Nora is connected to different people in the play. And maybe it'll look like this, right? She's married to this person, who's friends with this person, who loves that person, and then there's friends. But if you've read this play, you might say, wait, Mr. Escobar, you forgot. One of the most important characters. Well, you know what? I'm not here to do the work. You're here to do the work, right? This is the beginning of an example. And I want you to do this for the works that you've read. Take the main character, make all these connections. It's going to jar your memory. It's going to bring back the relationships between people, the dialogue between characters, the conflict between characters. Bringing this to your conscious mind is really important right now because for some of you, maybe you haven't read this in 10 months, in six months, in four months, and a lot has happened since. So these character maps could really help you just remember the events and the characters in the work. Another thing that you can do is something like this. So you can organize significant quotation, who was the speaker, what page number, and always, 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 what is the significance of that quotation? Organizing this would help you, again, become a master, an expert in this, in this text. Subjects and themes. Think of subjects as one or two word topics that are significant in a work. It might be relationships or uh, marriage or revenge or uh, friendship, right? One to two word subjects. And then you create a theme statement on each of those subjects. The theme statement would be a response to this question. Let's say we take Romeo and Juliet, right? And we say a subject in Romeo and Juliet, of course, is love. The theme statement then would be an answer to this question. What is William Shakespeare saying about love in Romeo and Juliet? If you're able to answer that, now you're really thinking about the meaning of the work as a whole. Now you're moving away from the text and really going to the author and what the author was thinking or conveying or interested in as they were writing this text. So write down a bunch of subjects and then compile these theme statements for each of the books that you have read. The idea is this. When I ask you what book you know best, I really don't care what your answer is right now. What I care about is you following some of the advice that I gave you today so that the, day, the night before your exam, if someone asks you, what book do you know best, you'll be able to answer. Don't worry if you haven't read 10 books, 15 books, eight books, six books, the number does not matter. You know two books well, you walk into that exam, knowing those two books, knowing those characters and that setting and those themes, and you're gonna do absolutely fine. Trust me. It's coming to an end, right? We have two review sessions. You have to join Ms. Scruggs tomorrow and then you're going to see me on Thursday. This is an absolute joy for me every single time. Thank you for the comments. Remember to click on the comment form underneath on the, in the YouTube page so that you can ask us questions so that we can address them in the last two sessions that we have left. This is Mr. Escobar signing off from Miami. Thank you so much for joining me. Good night.